Hey Chuck, what U.S. city has the most LEED certified buildings per capita? You know, that's an interesting question. And if you guys stay tuned, we'll have that answer for you at the end of the episode. G-Train to Church Avenue, next stop, Class and Avenue. Stay clear, close door. Welcome to The Urban Files, a show that provides news and analysis on a variety of city-related topics, how we live, work, play, and move around in the cities we love. Join your hosts, Max and Chuck, as they cover the latest news from the American urban landscape. So Max, how have things been going? <laughs> um, I think we're, we're hanging in there. We're doing all right. Um, honestly, we're, we're pretty lucky that I'd say our um, life hasn't been too affected. I know a lot of people in this country and around the world are going through much more serious hardships than we are right now. So we're definitely blessed from that standpoint, just kind of hanging at home pretty much all the time here in my in-law's house. We're just between the two houses. Um, so that's what we're doing. <laughs> How about you? You know, and I, I think you could not be more right about how lucky we are, you know, in terms of just this thing has really, I think, come on on a level that none of us saw coming. And it's had a severe impact, just so many places and so many people out of work. And, you know, I, I just, I really do count myself grateful and just obviously hoping that we'll be able to get to the finish line with this thing. You know, I mean, I, I sit back and I, I think about, oh man, like I missed a trip to London and I'm like, you know, that, that is, that, that's such a level of privilege on my part to be able to say something like that when the reality is so many people are really going through tough times yeah. right now. Yeah. It's funny that you say that. I was thinking the same thing. I had this trip coming up to China. And then, as you know, I talked to you a lot about it. You know, for weeks, we were like, what are we going to do? And we kind of adjusted our travel plans so that we'd still go to Asia, but now mm -hmm. just avoid China. And then in the end, just everything got canceled. And, and even at the time when we decided not to take the trip, I just couldn't fathom that, you know, our lives today would look the way it is right no. now. It, it, it's come on like a tidal wave almost, you know, like it, it's just like, like we could be saw it out there and, you know, like I, I think, what was it early January or that was when I was first starting to hear about it, but it felt so abstract and just like, you know, we, we've dealt with so many different things like SARS and, um, you know, swine flu in recent decades. And, you know, like th there were certain restrictions at certain points for like Zika would be another one, but it was not ever anything like this. And so I guess I just, until it happened, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, what's cool is that we're here talking now and we're still able to communicate um, with the glory of the internet and the digital <laughs> age. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is the start of our second season for the Urban Files, huh? Yes. <laughs> and that's exciting. Yeah. Um, of course, we recorded an entire first season and we don't know what we're going to do with it yet. But here we are plugging on and recording our second season. And I'm excited because <laughs> for the first episode today, we're going to have um, sort, of, uh, sort of a mentor of mine, Ennis Davis. Uh, he's going to join us in a moment. And it's going to be exciting to chat with him about how this whole outbreak is affecting the outlook of, of our cities and urban centers. Agreed. And really, I mean, I, I, I know that you knew, and it's more before this, but I really wasn't aware of the level of experience he had with, you know, the city of Jacksonville, but really with urbanism in general. He's really a historian, and I feel like, um, in addition to being an urbanist, and I feel like that will probably help him to potentially add some context to what we're trying to do. So, you know, this is our, our first guest on the show, and, you know, I think I'm really excited about it, and I know you probably are too. For sure, for sure. And this is background is in architecture, um, but uh, at, at some point in his career, he pivoted from architecture to, to planning in general, and he's been a consultant to a number of cities and a number of different projects. 
uh, private as well as government. Um, and so he has a, a wealth of knowledge and experience that he'll be able to share with us. Um, but I, I connected with him through um, one of the websites that he founded uh, over a decade ago um, that really focused a lot on urban urbanism and it went a long way in, in nurturing my uh, passion for, for this topic. Yeah, and, and I mean, what's awesome about that is in the digital age that we're able to form these relationships just like that. I, I know, um, you know, you and I were both in that um, entrepreneurship class really a, a few weeks ago. And I think it really talked to, I mean, the, the world is really your oyster. You know, you, you can reach out to so many talented people. And, you know, when you're able to make that initial connection, like you, you were with Ennis, I mean, maybe you didn't assume that we'd be doing this now eventually, but that, that's, um, you know, it, it really frees you even during a pandemic to be able to, you know, figure out more about the world and, and pursue your passions. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, so um, we'll bring Ennis on. Yeah, sounds good. When we come back. <laughs> All right. So I just wanted to mention our partner, Real Estate IQ, is number one in deal finding, a technology and data company focused on creating work from home automated systems for the real estate investment community. Real Estate IQ is trusted by over 60,000 active and passive investors. Real Estate IQ's mission is to empower your journey to freedom and success. The company is expanding nationally and they are looking for local partners to participate in their growth. To learn more, visit www.realestateiq.co. How's it been going? Not too bad, just surviving quarantine. <laughs> I hear that, I hear that. So it sounds yeah. like you're you're still real busy. It looks like you're in the office, yeah. Yeah, I actually uh, popped in the office for this exactly, but uh, yeah, I mean we're um, you know I'm in transportation, so right now my client's DOT, so they're considered yes. an essential service, I guess. They never stop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually probably busier now than I was before the, the virus outbreak. Gotcha. Really interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, not. most days are consistent conference calls. Your, your company is based in Chicago, right? It's right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, are you doing? Do you ever do a lot of these telecommuting calls, or are you usually just working face to face with the client? Um, the majority of the time, I'm down in uh, Orlando in my client's office. Uh, but yeah, it's you know, I'm basically managing other consultant projects for the state. So wow. even though I'm in Orlando, it's still a consistent barrage of conference calls. We don't use Zoom and some blue jeans, I think, in my office. Um, <laughs> yep. The state uses like GoTo or something like that. Uh, other consultants use other things, but they're all the same, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. And you're not, you're not shying away from the, uh, the Miami. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I've been a, I've been a, yeah, a Miami yeah. Everything fan uh, since a kid. You've been having a great yeah. season before we got into this, you know? I know. It's been unfortunate. I was actually uh, – that, that was a loss. I was watching the game, and during that, the Heat game, actually, uh, mm. is when the Utah Jazz player – that yeah. that game had gotten, gotten canceled. In the yeah, middle yeah. of the game, it was like, yeah, it's over. Everything's over. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, I mean, it was a shock for, for me. I mean, I, I just, like, I, I was thinking maybe they'll play the NCAA tournament without fans, but even that sounded irrational to me. I was just, I mean, I don't mean to say, like, I, I guess I really just miscalculated how big this is going to be. Yeah. I think we, I think we all did, but even when they were talking about playing in empty stadiums or on a cruise ship at one point, <laughs> none of it made any sense because all it would take no. is one person – to get sick and the whole right. thing. And that's the problem of bringing it back too, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm kind of skeptical if this is going to be a football season or anything like that at this point. I know. Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. Uh, the NFL is always um, uh, willing to, to do whatever it takes to, to make things happen. So I, I feel like they won't err on the side of caution, but, but you're right. Still, we, who knows? We'll see. I mean, look, I mean, even the Chinese basketball league hasn't started yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
I, I think some of the, the American players who are in that league, they're over there. I think oh, are they? Well, I, I figured well, I, here. this was a while, this was like a week or two ago I read that they were they were sending players back, but and then I haven't seen any follow up on that. So I, I know a few of them, a few of the guys, Jeremy Lin and a couple other people I was reading about were already flying back to uh, Marbury isn't still over there, is he? <laughs> Who is that? Marbury? Is Marbury still over there? I don't even know. Do you know? Is he I don't think so. He was, but he's raising money over yeah. there. He's, getting, he's yeah, bringing yeah. ventilators or something back to America. Uh, he's good. like a part owner, and, he's a, and he has some kind of like a special, special visa, um, you know, re- residency status. So he, uh, he, he may be living there. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> really so, Ennis, it's great to have you on. Um, I appreciate yes. you taking the time to join us. Um, I was just talking to Chuck earlier. I consider you a mentor for me in, in this, this space, this urban, urban planning, real estate, I appreciate you know, all that. The development kind of stuff. I've, I've come to you for a lot of help and advice. And, uh, and so, yeah, so uh, really thank you for joining us today. Um, mm-hmm. I believe you're with Alfred Benish. Did I say that right? Alfred Benish yes, right. as a senior transportation planner and also the co-founder of the websites J- the jackson and modern cities and and so uh i know chuck's really excited to talk to you as well absolutely yeah i mean i, I read your bio and also beyond that i saw that you're a author kind of like and have the background of the history of urbanism so yeah i feel like that might add some insight to what we're you know talking about today too yeah, I've, I've dibbled and dabbled on a few things over the years, I guess. Very humble. So, um, so yeah, we were just, uh, I mean, we were just catching up a little bit, but we wanted to, to see how, uh, how your sort of home life and just day-to-day life has been affected by all of this. Well, I mean, I, I've, I've lost some weight. I mean, I don't, uh, since all the restaurants <laughs> closed down, the bars are shut down. I don't, uh, <laughs> not so I can eat a little bit healthier. Uh, I can work out more because it's more time on my hands. I'm not uh, commuting these days a lot. You know, most days I'm on the road. So right now, um, you know, some nights I've gone to bed at 11, 12, midnight and realized, wow, I can still get like seven, eight hours of sleep before I even have to like get in front of this computer. <laughs> so right. so right. That's, that's been pretty interesting. But um you know, on the work side, I mean, work actually hasn't changed a lot for me since it's all a lot of infrastructure and planning. Um, my assumption is at some point, a lot of the infrastructure projects are probably start moving forward a lot earlier. I know down in Orlando, and I guess here in Jacksonville, where I'm at right now, uh, some of the road construction projects have actually uh, picked up a bit and, and the schedules have moved up because there's not a lot of people on the streets. Mm-hmm. So it gives them a chance to get out and uh, get some construction done a lot quicker. But, uh, you know, I kind of anticipate the economy will continue to uh, get worse. Yeah. And at that point, you know, we may need some type of, you know, governmental stimulus or something in the form of jobs. So I, I assume that infrastructure will likely be a part of that. So on my end, I guess I'm lucky because I'm in that industry. Uh, but I assume, as of right now, I'll, I'll probably be busy for the foreseeable future. And infrastructure is an area where people can agree on uh, spending money, it seems like, from both <laughs> sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, down here in Miami, I, I have seen some, like, sort of, like, streetscape and um, sort of paving, road pavings and stuff uh, kind of getting pushed up, just like you said, because of a lot of the businesses that normally would be affected uh, it's not, you know, this is the, an opportune time to get those projects done. So um, I know you were talking about how busy you've been with this process, but w- what has been going on with the ridership of transit in this region? Is it, do you think that there's been some pushback about it? I, I know that New York City has still had a, a decently significant value of ridership thanks to having so many essential workers, but I wasn't sure if that was also true in you know, Jacksonville and the other Florida big cities at all. I wasn't sure what your insights were on that. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Virgin Trains or Brightline, that's shut down right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's more, that's a privately funded um, transit system. But yeah, I mean, it's been a decline in ridership. 
uh, primarily because most people are either working from home or laid off at this point. Uh, so it's just not, and most of the state is under a kind of stay at home, safe distancing policy at this point. So there's restricted mobility during the day. And uh, that certainly affected um, transit, just like it's affected uh, the traffic counts on, on, on the regular streets. Yeah. Do, do you foresee there being significant public pushback against public transit moving forward because of this? Or do you think that, that will, there will still be a go ahead for a number of projects that are set to happen or moving forward? So I think right now we may be in the beginning stages of all of this. I know a lot of people talked talked about trying to reopen the economy up in a month or so or, or May. <laughs> uh, the, the realistic possibility or the realistic um, outcome of that without a vaccine is you'll end up right back where you're at. So, you know, until we get a vaccine, I, I don't know what the outcome may be. I don't think any of us know. I know we've got mm-hmm. a lot of professionals out there that are kind of making their opinions and everything. But at this point, um, you can go two routes. If you got a vaccine that comes up pretty soon, things will probably go right back to normal. Uh, if you were in a situation where there is no vaccine, we could be we could have these incremental periods of uh, uh, social distancing for the next two years or so. The last the last thing I heard this morning, was uh, it 2022 yeah. or something? And uh, you know that could have a major impact on the design of transit, uh, the design of uh, buildings. I mean, our everyday life would basically change because of that. Um, and anything that's up on the grabs or up on the table now in terms of funding, you probably have to take another look at that. Like I know in Orlando, uh, before all of this, uh, this pandemic outbreak, there was a big push to have a sales tax that was going to go to transportation in a lot of uh, transit projects in Central Florida. Uh, right now, I don't know where that stands. I mean, mm-hmm. I assume it's still in the books right now, but if things continue the way they continue, who knows how the public reacts to that uh, down the line. I mean, even you know, here in Jax, the council last night just passed um, a resolution to allow for a sales tax for the school district in November. Mm-hmm. And even in that case, you know, if the economy continues to decline, Right. You know, what we thought would have been a possibility is a month or two ago it may be completely different by uh, November. So uh, right now, from my outlook, I think we're all in the beginning of stages of this, um, but there's literally two different routes things can go. And it, to me, it really depends on if we have a vaccine or not. Right, right. <laughs> Wonderful. It sounds like we'll be uh, paying consultants for more studies to decide whether to move forward with projects that we already signed off on or not. Uh, we know about that very well in Jacksonville. My um, hope my hope would be that we can always move away from that and move into a world yeah. of implementation. Yeah. So right. My, my uh, selfish aspirational dream would be uh, that we can take some lessons and things that we've seen in the last month and apply that to the infrastructure side. So if there is uh a bill or something that a stimulus that moves infrastructure projects up, maybe we have a chance to invest in a different way than what we've done in the past. So maybe we can put more money into uh, bike pad projects, for example. You've seen once once everything shut down, you saw everybody start to flood to the, either the beaches or uh, these shared use paths, parks, and all these spaces have gotten overcrowded. And so maybe that means in this new norm or whatever it is, uh, uh, an additional emphasis on public space and mobility outside of what we've traditionally seen is something we we take a look at, hopefully. Well, I think to your point, like, I think we're starting to see some good signs with that. Like I know Oakland, I think, for instance, was closing off some roads to cars and making them, you know, I think pedestrian primarily a, just because there's a low volume of traffic right now, but B, you know, having more places for people to be out prevents the spread uh, on a certain set. So it's, it's at least a short-term solution there. But the other thing is I wonder if, if potentially, I know there's that concept of like that 20-minute radius from your house and 
I wonder if the new normal might be more remote working in terms of be able to make that village come a little closer to us. So, I mean, you know, I know we talk a lot about remote work and I think, you know, some of us are, we're blessed and privileged to have the opportunity to work remotely, but the majority of the country probably doesn't have an opportunity. So there may be a new normal, but uh, where telecommuting makes more sense to, I guess, in, in some of the white collar jobs, mm -hmm. uh, but the majority of the country probably still won't have that opportunity. So the percentage of that new normal is probably small, I guess I would say. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it, there's always, you know, that possibility. When you mentioned that maybe transit would change and, and buildings design would change, what, is there anything in particular that you're thinking? Well, so if you look at it from a building standpoint, and we had a brief discussion on this at, on another conference call last week, my company, but um, from an architectural standpoint, the design of say foyers and entrances, uh, common areas, may change, you know, how you know, elevator shafts, how, how many people you put in elevators and things like that. Uh, we may have to take a look at at some point in the future. That may change from how we operate today. You know, if you put, we'll go back in history, if you go back to before 9-11, um, you know, if you dropped a family member off the airport, you could actually go up to the gate and watch them get on the <laughs> gate and walk on a plane and take off. That's 9-11, that changed. You can't get past the mm -hmm. airport anymore. So, I mean, it'll likely be some type of changes. Um, I think we're still in the learning process of, of this whole uh, disease. We don't know exactly uh, all the details of surrounding it. And as time goes on, we learn more information. I think that'll uh, trigger more of a factor on how you, how you design things going forward. But yeah, I mean, you look at airports, uh, the cruise ship, the cruise terminal down in, down in Miami. How is that? How is that going right now? Yeah, <laughs> uh, Carnival is down, and right now they're saying they're not going to, I guess, sell any again to July, which I think that's still pretty ambitious. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's that's got a huge impact on South Florida's uh, tourism economy. So you know, what is the impact of that? The, the thousands of people in South Florida are employed in in that industry. What's the outfall of that? Uh, our airports, you know, Miami's airport, Orlando's, you know, Atlanta's, um, you know, how is air travel and how has that change um, following all of this? And that almost looks at Florida's economy as a whole, which is built off tourism. Yeah. Um, if people aren't traveling at the same rate they were prior to this, what's the impact on our theme parks, our hotels, our restaurants? Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that um, are related to this and, you know, we haven't even discussed the whole mental health issue of being laid off or being socially isolated mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of people have to, challenges they have to overcome. Right. It's, it's a major can of worms, you know, in, in terms of all the impacts or all that could come out of this. And I think, as you say, that we're it's so early in the process that it's hard to really say what's going to happen. Yeah. When you mentioned the airports, I think you, you saw that uh, Jacksonville's uh, new concourse that we've been waiting on for a decade is, is on the shelf again. Uh, yeah, they're pretty it. much uh, up in smoke at this point. I actually made an Instagram post for the Jackson on that. I got some pushback. Uh -huh. and, you know, a few people were saying, oh, well, you know, air traffic was growing before then. It would pick right back up uh, as soon as this whole thing ends. And if we look back in history, we went through this once. It wasn't a pandemic, but in 2008, 2009 is when they first was planning that expansion project mm -hmm. and the economy fell apart. Mm -hmm. They put it on the shelf then. It didn't resurface till, mm -hmm. till 10 years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's put back on the shelf again. And when you're looking at the uh, air industry in general, you would assume even as the economy starts to open back up, everything won't be the same. You'd ramp up slowly. So you've actually taken a step, well, a significant step back in terms of what traffic was. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take time to build that back up. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we're in a recession, you know, that's an additional time. So yeah, it's on the shelf. It makes sense to put it on the shelf. It's unfortunate. But my guess is 
that's probably the first of many projects that it will eventually be delayed in some type of way. You know, I feel like this is this pandemic is potentially birthing some, you know, NIMBYs and just that whole process. So, but I feel like there's examples really outside of the U.S. and even within the U.S. where people want to blame density. That's like the first place people go. So what would you say to someone that was going to, you know, use that as a reason that, you know, our current city makeup is not ideal in, in its current form? Um, anytime somebody mentions density, I think that you're kind of looking at things on the surface and not looking into the details. I would argue with you that going to church in Walchula, Florida is no safer than going to church in Miami, Florida. Completely agree. <laughs> uh, if you were buying groceries in Orange Park, your chance of coming into contact with somebody who's been exposed is probably just as high as your chance of coming in contact with somebody in a grocery store shopping in groceries in New Orleans. Uh, So it's not really a density issue. It's a a clustering issue, I like to say. And clustering takes, can take place anywhere. Uh, You're just as likely to cluster in the post office or in a McDonald's in California as you are in Missouri. Uh, um, So how you design spaces becomes more, to me, it becomes more of a significant issue. I mean, I could be in um, a row house in Harlem and, and practice social distancing just fine. I got my own door. I don't have to come into contact with anybody. And I'm in the, one of the densest cities in the world that actually has an outbreak. On mm-hmm. the other end, I could be in you know, Sarasota, for example, and be living in an apartment complex where I have to mash the same buttons on an elevator, or I could say in a gated community, I have to mash the buttons to get into the gate, I have to mash the buttons to get <laughs> to the community center, to get to the pool, to get to the fitness center, to get to the mailbox. Uh, so this is a really issue. It's design of spaces, how people interact within those spaces. And you know, ultimately, as long as this is an airborne disease and you don't have um, – a vaccine. I don't think any of that makes any right. hill of beans at this point anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So that, that's my answer to density. It's not a density issue. It is a clustering issue. And um, you could probably extract land use and built environment to a degree and how people interact within those spaces. And those are the things that going forward, we might want to look into as an industry to see how we can uh, reshape some of those spaces in the case of pandemics like this. Right, right. It's funny because, I mean, I feel like a lot of uh, urban design conversations are are how you can sort of activate spaces and and bring people together. And now we have to shift and see how can we, uh, how can we do the opposite when when we need to? So that's a suburban urban conversation. I I feel like though, maybe in a rural setting um, where social distancing is almost a norm, Maybe maybe it, there's a different factor at play there than, than in. No, well, I mean I don't know because in a rural setting you still had a rural church, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but I'm saying that because I grew up in a small town, yeah. so uh, you know my town probably had, I guess you would call it rural now, but back when I was a kid, maybe twenty thousand people. Mm-hmm. And if you uh, went two or three blocks, actually, if you walked across the street from my house, it was nothing but orange groves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that same neighborhood where I grew up at is in in Polk County, Central Florida. In that particular county, that zip code has the uh, highest number of uh, COVID-19 incidents in the county. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an underrepresented community, so I don't know exactly why, uh, but it is what it is. It's not a place that anybody would consider to be dense you know um so even though you have these rural communities um the lifestyles we've set up and we've lived for centuries have always involved things like uh public markets or stores um city halls uh, churches you know are we ready to do online church going going forward. I mean, we just had a preacher in Tampa get arrested you know, two weeks ago. <laughs> church so, um, I'm not for sure 
a rural area actually makes things any safer, I guess to me it would be sort of like moving to a gated community and having this false sense of security that you're protected. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would argue that even within a rural community, you still have chances mm -hmm. of exposure unless you're growing your own product, you don't <laughs> leave your land, you don't <laughs> interact with anybody, not even your family members, and then maybe, just maybe, uh, you don't become exposed. But in reality, that's not the U.S. for the most part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not the world for the most part, I would say. I mean, most of us, I think, if we try to live like our great-grandparents, great-grandparents did uh, centuries ago, most of us would die anyway. So <laughs> I'm not for sure that, that we're actually equipped to... To, That's very uh, true. Yeah. yeah. To do things all on our own, hunt, catch our own food, do all that type stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, our society today is all built off of social interaction in, in some type of way. Yeah. yeah. And even then, as you say, like there's that, um, you know, like Dawson, Georgia, I think was one of the worst instances. And I think in a city, you can put protocol in place to, kind of manage the situation where in America, we're, we're always just, it seems like we're always done to go, you know, like it, and it's, it's, I don't know. So, so uh, like, so, so going back to clustering, cause you mentioned Georgia. So two small areas that have, have had significant outbreaks, Albany, Georgia, and there's another small town in uh, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. All been in Georgia, their your rate uh, <laughs> per thousand of being potentially exposed uh, to COVID is much is significantly higher than Miami's and is even higher than New York City's. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that stemmed from, from what I understand, was a funeral. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So here you could, you could be in a smaller place, but if somebody mm -hmm. dies and people mm -hmm. determine that they're going to go pay their respects mm -hmm. in an enclosed spot. Mm -hmm. When you have a lot of people, you still you're still exposed. Yeah. And in San San uh, South Dakota, that issue was, I believe, involving a, a meat packing plant and the workers within the plant. Mm -hmm. So here you could be in a rural place in the middle of nowhere, but if you got a couple hundred people working inside of a factory and somebody's exposed, now you got an outbreak. What have you found are the positive examples? I mean, obviously, really the thing is just the social distancing and the staying home. But what do you what have you heard specific countries like, or what have we noticed South Korea or Japan or, or ta Taiwan or Singapore are doing to effectively curb the spread here? Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I hadn't really kept track of a lot of the countries overseas and, um, you know, their reaction uh, to this whole thing. Uh, one of the challenges always is when dealing with other countries and in, in the U S is uh, culture and, public policy and um, you know, politics that, you know, that always kind of works itself into it. So um, a lot of times I, I try to focus more on what various cities um, are doing within our own kind of our own cultural structure, mm -hmm. because even within the U.S., I think there are still um, some areas that are doing better than other areas and some areas that are instituting policies that others aren't. Um, yeah. And so assuming or believing in that there's nothing new under the sun, uh, I think you could almost dust off the books and go back to the Spanish flu. You can look at yellow fever in the 18th, 19th century and heck, probably even black plague if you go back further enough and, yeah. and, and pull some lessons out that <laughs> we're going to repeat here. Of course, nowadays we're just so much more connected globally that I feel like that definitely is a, a major factor in how the COVID-19 spread. Um, yeah, there's a French cruise ship. They had an outbreak, I guess, last month. And it was on CNN. And, and those who were tested who weren't visibly showing symptoms were allowed to fly back to the U.S., landed in Atlanta, Atlanta's mm -hmm. airport. And if they weren't showing any signs, they basically just let a mix with the rest of the people in the airport. <laughs> Uh, catch flights to whatever other cities they were going to. Um, so you can see how things are spread that way. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I mean, if this, if this 
first outbreak was in China. You know, how do you think it got here? Probably through here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are connected cities. That's most likely why New York has an outbreak right now. And I think if you took a look at the U.S. and even actually the entire globe, and you looked at the major cities that are considered to be tourism destinations, you most likely have large outbreaks there as opposed to um, other major cities that aren't like you haven't heard much about El Paso, Texas. <laughs> I mean, between it's El true. Paso and, and uh, you know the other the border city on the other side of Mexico, I mean, they got well over a million people there. And they're yeah. pretty dense, but you haven't heard anything. Yeah, Chuck, you were mentioning like uh, I think you said Minneapolis, St. Paul was kind of yes. under the radar as well, and we're speculating. Um, <laughs> For other reasons, though, more more cultural, <laughs> or, well, or well, see, that's like I have Finnish heritage, and so I mean I can speak to that's the lifeblood of uh, you know one point five meters is like a, a part is like a, a Finnish person's dream, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that definitely helps. You know, you can see the you can see the cultural factors at play on a certain level with different areas. Yeah, or. Or like what Ennis was saying, I don't have statistics in front of me, but maybe uh, there's just less travel in and out of Minneapolis during the winter. Uh, than there. That, that could be a factor. I mean, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it could be less travel, but by the same token, you know, San Diego, which is one of my favorite cities and is always like 70 degrees a year round, mm -hmm. um, you know, they've got, they've got less cases than what we have here in Jacksonville, and they're you know, three or four times the size of us. So, yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm – I think we're still in a learning process of how this thing is going around. Um, but there does seem to be a large correlation to a degree uh, of significant centers of tourism or significant areas with uh, large airports, for example, yes. mm -hmm. uh, being places where you have a higher percentage of cases. Okay, I guess my final thought would be we're just in the beginning. Um, but I think this is an opportunity to uh, develop some routines within your lifestyle. Enough in our lifestyles, we haven't had a chance because we've been, you know, so busy all over the years. So you know, definitely reach out to your friends, family, make contact, um, keep each other up uh, emotionally, emotionally and spiritually. And I would say, you know, when this is all over, there will be a new normal. Uh, we don't know what it may be but i can tell you we can we will we'll be resilient because um you know this is not something that's uh has not happened in the past uh we got over the plague we got yeah. over yellow fever we got over um a lot of other diseases uh spanish flu you don't hear much about ebola these days anymore mm -hmm. um so i do believe that there'll be a new normal but you know, everything will uh, work out all right. Really, the primary point I wanted to make is, you know, I think um, to what Ennis was saying, I think we'll get through this. But I mean, I really, going back to our point at the start of the show, I think there's a lot of people having a hard time with this. And I just want to encourage people, really, if you are ordering takeout, which, you know, probably some of us are still, you know, in social distancing ways, um, try to support your small businesses. It's... Um, you know, I really have found that they are the lifeblood of our cities. And even in, in my case, um, there's a, a lady that um, named Laura, and she owns a, a small business called The Taco Spot. And it was a, just a vendor at our local farmer's market, and it grew and developed into a bricks and mortar place. And, you know, it really brings something to the community because they're probably some of the best tacos you can get outside of Mexico. And um, other than that, it, it's just – it it supports, it brings the community together and it puts money back in your community. So that, that's really the best advice that I'd give to people, you know, when they're out and being consumers still. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, when we come out on the other side as a society, we'll make it, but a lot of businesses won't. So uh, I definitely echo your sentiment, Chuck. Um, I was just going to twist it a little bit and say, um, we can also use this time, connect with uh, each other, our friends, and family, um, maybe people that we haven't been in touch with as often as we'd like. And, and this is a great time to do that and just make sure we're all being safe. And, and once this is finally all over, make sure that we survived and, 
and uh, hopefully blossom some new relationships. So, all right. Thanks, Ennis, for coming on. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Oh, anytime, anytime. Yeah. So our trivia question for today was sent to me by my wife. <laughs> Kelly asked, uh, which U.S. city has the most LEED certified buildings per capita? And uh, I was not surprised to see that because in her former corporate life, one of her main responsibilities and roles was in the sustainability uh, of a very, very large uh, international corporation. So this was one of her uh, passions. Absolutely. And, and so that makes sense why she asked that. And so, um, you know, the first thought that really came to mind for me was Portland, Oregon. And just given the whole um, Pacific Northwest and how new of a city it is and how, how much emphasis there is on, you know, energy efficient buildings and design, and even the fact that they have rules against um, certain levels of development past a certain point, I feel like right. Portland's my guess there. Right, right. What about you, Max? Yeah, no, that, that's the first place my mind went to as well. Um, it was kind of a theme in my one and only visit there. We, we kept seeing all these different things from lead certification to like tons of EV charging stations. This was eight years ago. And so for us, it was like, wow, this is such a green community. Uh, at the same time, I wonder if it's going to be something like a smaller city within a really large metro, something like Cambridge in the Boston area or Arlington, Virginia. The safest guess would be Portland, but there's there's a few other possibilities. I don't know. <laughs> good point. Yeah. No, no, those are good. Those are strong guesses you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we could lock in Portland, Oregon as our final answer. <laughs> final answer. And um, so it looks like the answer is actually Jacksonville, North Carolina. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, kinda, we were coming at this from the wrong angle, um, <laughs> and really, what the question meant was the most residential lead projects per capita. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that put Jacksonville, North Carolina, at number one with four point six per thousand people, and then Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Fairbanks, Alaska, are two and three. <laughs> Interesting. And see, the, the those two I would have expected. Really, I haven't even heard of Jacksonville. I'm guessing it's kind of close to the Outer Banks, but I guess it makes sense, you know, because when you're thinking about a small level population city like that, you really don't have to have a tremendous amount of the highest per capita. Yeah, yeah exactly. It could just be one major development project. The data gets skewed by yeah. when you have such a small sample and there may be tax incentives or credits for solar panels and other types of uh, sustainability add-ons. So yeah, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting uh, thing to know. I'm sure we'll see things like that popping up around the country. Uh, in the Absolutely, especially moving forward at, I mean, green is, is like the new in, and that really um, stratifies urban, suburban, wherever you wanna go. Right, I hope so. Yeah. So, All right. We'll talk next time, Chuck. Absolutely. It was fun. Have a good week, everyone.